How are time and the climate crisis linked to each other? Today, academic and public discourses more frequently address what impact our perception of time may have on our understanding of climate change and our respective engagement or non-engagement with the climate crisis. Professor Kyle Powers White, a prominent indigenous philosopher and environmental justice scholar, has demonstrated in his work how, in fact, the Western notion of linear time can impede fair climate policies and therefore real climate justice. He shows how awareness about different forms of telling time in indigenous cultures, such as cyclic time, dystopian time and time as kinship, hold immense potential. Why draws our attention to the fact that there are indeed many ways and much better ways than the near time to think about climate change. Generally, the common notion of climate change that presupposes a linear understanding of time is still the default in most of the global public discourses. We just need to turn on the news. Climate change is reported in a linear fashion by identifying and analyzing changes in weather and nature phenomena such as the average temperatures, precipitation, winds, atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases, sea levels, rates of deforestation, the circulation of ocean currents and the loss of species and biodiversity throughout specified time periods. On the contrary then, thinking about climate change in terms of kinship time, as White proposes, means something totally different. White writes, kinship time, as opposed to linear time, reveals how today's climate change risks are caused by people not taking responsibility for one another's safety, well-being and self-determination. And kinship time tracks change according to shifts in kinship relationships. As a result, White defines kinship as an ethic of shared responsibility that naturally also entails interdependence. Kinship here refers to relations between humans, but also other than human beings and our environment that facilitate societal responsiveness to complexity, change or crisis. As moral bonds, these relationships are characterized by reciprocity, consent, trust, transparency and confidentiality, for example. And these kinship ties are in no way limited to biological family, culture, ethnicity or species. The climate crisis then, in those terms, is a change in these kinship relations in the form of massive damage or destruction. This indeed has already been a centuries-long traumatic reality of dystopian time for indigenous peoples long before the effects of the Industrial Revolution and the exploitation of the Earth found a global audience. White maintains that it is necessary to repair those kinship relations if we really want to find a solution to the climate crisis. This is also in stark contrast with the panicked reactivity of most policymakers today that produces what he calls crisis epistemologies. These crisis epistemologies are, by the way, also further addressed by Brian Nichols in his talk here. In other words, looking for a quick fix, often only consisting of technological and scientific solutions in the existing structures of industrial economies, constantly reproduces the same injustices through aspects of capitalist, colonialist and patriarchal practices and structures. I would like to mention that I'm of course here aware about the fact that I, as a non-indigenous and German scholar, employ here indigenous concepts and therefore do so with special respect, care and mindfulness as they certainly carry many layers of meaning and sacredness that I'm not able to understand. As a background for this talk, during the 2021 Mind and Life Summer Institute that addressed the mind, human earth connection and the climate crisis, I was able to learn from indigenous scholars and activists such as Kyle White and Lila June, who inspired me to look closer into this fascinating topic of time, Buddhist environmental ethics in Bhutan and the climate crisis. 
my motivation to bring the indigenous concept of time as kinship into conversation with my research about Buddhist ethics and the environment in Bhutan is also connected to my personal environmental engagement. And today I would like to think together with you about possible ways to perceive the climate crisis. Today, my introduction and discussion about the concept of the age of strife in the Bhutanese legal code from 1729 adds then to our discussion about Buddhist eschatology and central Buddhist concepts of time concerning the climate crisis. Moreover, at the end, I would like to very briefly mention some aspects of conservation strategies and interspecies relationships that are today discussed in Bhutan. They bear witness of the strong influence of Bhutan's Buddhist heritage and Buddhist principles in the sense of White's kinship as a shared responsibility. First, it is important to know that the Bhutanese legal code from 1729 we are talking about today has been abundantly appropriated in modernity to institutionalize and transform the so-called joint default system of governance into the legal framework of the constitution of the Kingdom of Bhutan from 2008. In brief, the joint twofold system of governance combined and combines still in Bhutan a twofold religious and political structure under a Buddhist ruler and was common in the Tibetan cultural area. It was institutionalized in the 17th century in Tibet, Bhutan and Sikkim. Moreover, today Bhutan's Buddhism-induced policies of gross national happiness strongly focus on fair, sustainable socio-economic development and environmental conservation, besides good governance and conservation and promotion of a vibrant culture as its four pillars. Bhutan has been leading in the global public discourse about alternative development models, which eventually led to the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, in 2015. Moreover, Bhutan links South and East Asia geographically, but also culturally and linguistically and has never been colonized. Therefore, it's a unique example of Tibetan Buddhist modernity with this alternative non-Western development path. Let us now turn to the concept of the Age of Strife that is defined in Indian sources as the last of four progressively degenerating world ages. Originally from a non-Buddhist context, it was later abundantly adopted in the Tibetan Buddhist world. Typical signs of degeneration in this age are the five corruptions, consisting of a decrease in lifespan, morality and the length of the cosmic period, as well as the increase of emotional defilements and false views. Furthermore, in this age, wars, natural disasters, diseases and epidemics are the prevailing challenges due to these inner imbalances. Up to the present day, this concept has been pervasively appropriated in diverse Tibetan Buddhist literary genres, such as polemic, doxographical, philosophical and liturgical literature, but also legal writings, historiography and biography. And it is also popular in some convert Buddhist communities and prominently resurfaced in the COVID-19 pandemic. We will now take a closer look at how in the Bhutanese legal code from 1729, the didactics of the age of strives, how I call it, then have been used not only as a theoretical concept of time, but to enact ethical behavior in society to ensure collective well-being and happiness. As background, the Bhutanese legal code from 1729 is the first formalized and standardized legal code of Bhutan and was composed by the 10th chief abbot of Bhutan, Tenzin Chögyal. But we should not imagine this work as a formalized and kind of bureaucratic legal codex, but as a work that conveys important Buddhist ethical and cosmological principles and a Buddhist political philosophy. 
It is ornamented by numerous vivid quotations from other text genres such as Buddhist canonical and extra canonical works, advice literature, proverbs and sayings and former birth stories of the Buddha. In this legal code now, the concept of the age of strife serves to explain situations in relation to the above mentioned five corruptions. Here these are mostly the decrease in morality of lay and religious persons in society, the increase in emotional defilements and false views leading to dispute and wars, and also various types of resultant external imbalances such as natural disasters, famines and diseases, for example. We could think here of the devastating Bhutanese earthquake of 1714 with a magnitude of 8. In other words, the signs of the age of strife should not be just accepted as collective karma and impossible to change, but should lead to action, creating happiness and well-being for sentient beings according to Buddhist ethics and tantric Buddhist cosmology also naturally includes restoring and maintaining relationships in the Buddhist mandala with all sentient beings and forces. These relationships should be characterized by compassion, non-violence and reciprocity, ergo what White calls an ethics of shared responsibility. In sum, the rhetorics of the age of strife do not lead to apathy, but the contrary, action. In that sense, we can also learn today from this mindset. Not all is lost. Moreover, the importance and good governance and legislation is emphasized here, as, of course, religious law and moral, moral have naturally deteriorated in the age of strife. Exemplarily, I will share here my textual analysis of different emic terminologies of happiness and well-being as a semantic field from the legal code that reveal these different connotations of balance, shared responsibility, reciprocity and trust between government, the Buddhist ruler and society. Two terms translate as happiness and joy in this context. They refer to the well-being of people in a general sense and are used to denote a form of happiness that is achieved through following Buddhist doctrine and ethics, essential full function society. Then, furthermore, a distinct term is frequently used for any actions, ceremonies or rituals which are carried out to create or maintain happiness and well-being of the people or to counteract disbalances and react to challenges and disaster. Then benefit and happiness, or we can also say beneficial happiness, is always employed in conjunction with a concrete reference to the state, the laws themselves, or the districts and country. Finally, Kido, which is a royal prerogative of the kings of Bhutan nowadays and has been a long-standing former informal principle of mutual aid, kinship and support in the Tibetan cultural area, is used when pointing out the concrete responsibilities of rulers, ministers and government officials alike, to observe and, if necessary, to balance the collective happiness and welfare status of the people. It is a principle that is nowadays very important for the whole of Bhutanese society. In sum, we see that the didactics of the age of strife help to create a sense of a shared societal responsibility and urgency to act according to Buddhist ethical and cosmological principles that were considered to counteract or at least alleviate complexity, disaster and crises during the age of strife to ensure, of course, happiness and well-being of sentient beings. Furthermore, this shared societal responsibility has supported identity and nation-building processes since then and today strongly influences also environmental policies in Bhutan. In conclusion, let us be courageous and honest enough to look at the climate crisis and its challenges as a massive crisis of our kinship relations and think it in terms of kinship time, as White proposes then naturally relationships move to the fore rather than linear changes in weather and natural phenomena that are supposedly objectively described and need to be dealt with. In this regard, 
The recently published assessment of conservation priorities for Bhutan from a technical working group consisting of government agencies, NGOs, the monastic bodies in Bhutan, individual scientists, farmers and other informants, offers us lots of food for thought, especially for the repairing and mending of interspecies relations. Although Bhutan is popularly well known to be the only carbon negative country in the world and its commitment to remain carbon neutral in the future, as well as its constitutional mandate to protect a minimum of 60% forest cover, are very much admired, it is also already heavily affected by the climate crisis and identified as one of the 36 global hotspots of biodiversity. Equally important, about 62.3% of Bhutan's population live in rural areas where agriculture and livestock farming remain the main livelihood sources. To address, therefore, future challenges and the ethics of interspecies relations is critical. Bhutan has already reacted to these new challenges by developing innovative, non-violent and holistic approaches and legislation informed by Buddhist perspectives. These address, for example, human wildlife conflicts, endemic, threatened and underrepresented species, livestock, meat consumption and the restric restriction of it, and Buddhist life release practices for animals. In sum, Bhutan aims to incorporate animal rights, animal protection and animal liberation widely into its conservation strategies and the working group has proposed a gross national happiness index for animals and plants that could be based on the gross national happiness index for humans. This would set an extremely positive international precedence for rethinking, repairing and healing interspecies relations ergo kinship relations globally. With this, I would like to conclude my talk here and I'm looking forward to our discussion and your questions. <laughs>